This message entitled Confirming the Word was delivered to Christ Our Rock Bible Church on May 13, 2018 by the Rev. Roy D. Warren, Jr. The scripture reference is Mark 16, 19-20. Praise God. Mark chapter 16, and it's only verses 19 and 20. Just verses 19 and 20. And that will bring us to the conclusion of what we're looking at all these weeks. <coughs> Praise the Lord. So it's Mark 16, otherwise known as the chapter of unbelief, because there's so many times nobody believes what's going on with the resurrection until finally they know Him. Finally they see Him. Finally they can even touch Him in certain circumstances. Praise the Lord. So we want to go ahead and look at these two verses, 19 and 20. Amen. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. 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 Father, it's been several weeks now and you have shown us clearly what all you have given to the Gospel writer Mark to share. I don't believe he left anything out from what you told him. I don't believe he added anything from what you told him. I'm sure this is exactly what you inspired him to write. But Lord, there are also other accounts and other resurrection appearances that happen at these very moments, at these very verses, at these very times. Uh, and unless we bring them into play, at least to a certain extent, uh, we kind of lose track of these other ones. And so we want to put them all together and uh, just uh, very uh, quickly, dear God, come to see that you are talking for a people, dear God, speaking for a people to rise up and truly confirm the word. Confirm the word. Hallelujah. Lord, we saw that just a week or two ago, and now here it is here again uh, with us, and we want to thank you for that. The, com the matter of confirming the word, knowing it is true, coming away from the places of unbelief, that we sometimes find ourselves in. And certainly all these followers of Jesus uh, were in unbelief at one time. But praise God you took them further. Praise God you, you showed them, Lord, that you were for real and that you did indeed rise from the dead and ascend into heaven. And praise God the whole thing, the whole thing was intended to show the need for the Holy Spirit. Now you would be gone off this planet and they would need the Holy Spirit actually dwelling within them. So I want to thank you, dear God, that these things all have a purpose. I believe the, 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 the whole of the Bible, dear God, is to be taken as something that leads us to the next step. And we thank you for that, Lord. So we just lift you up and exalt you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. I'm so proud of my son, bragged one mother. He's going to a psychiatrist. And the other person said, you're proud of him for going to a shrink? Yes. There aren't many people who can shell out that kind of money for something like that. And besides that, all he talks about to the psychiatrist is me. <laughs> now you saw that one coming. Yeah, you, you saw that one coming. Yeah, I, Evidently not quite understanding, you know. Um, <laughs> All he talks to the psychiatrist is about me. 
A group of parents were talking one evening about their children being away at summer camp. How do you get them to write home, inquired one young mother. Uh, it's pretty easy, actually, an older woman replied, having gone through it with her own children. You simply write them a letter saying, here's five dollars to buy candy and ice cream and gum or whatever you want. And, and then the other person said, well, what about that makes them write home? Well, you conveniently forget to enclose the five dollars and they write home. She says, it works every time. But, I, you know, I'm not sure that's the goal, to just get a piece of paper from the kid who is away at camp if all it's doing is begging for money when it ought to be more of a relationship-oriented kind of thing, like, hi, Mom, how you doing? Just, on, just the other day on the radio, I heard them telling a story about a woman in Australia who recommends asking infants, newborn infants, few-month-old infants, if they want their diapers changed. <laughs> you got to respect them. They don't want you taking the diaper off. You shouldn't take it off. We're getting kind of crazy in our society, I think. You know, going overboard with, with this stuff. These, these children are given as, or in trust to the parents that are chosen by God to, you know, to raise them up in the admonition and the, the knowing of the Lord and, and, and so forth. And we're going a little bit crazy when we have to ask an infant who isn't going to answer you anyway if it's okay if I take off your diaper. I mean, would that embarrass you too much? I mean, what's the kid going to do? Sit around with bad diapers for years until he finally can say, I don't like this. You know, this is, it's, it really is getting crazy. I mean, I don't know that there would be many people that would, you know, agree with that lady over in Australia. But, you know, there are, there's some craziness going on as we, uh, I suppose you could call it, go overboard to be politically correct. Um, and you may have other terms for it or whatever, but there's, a, there's just a craziness that's going on that, that uh, get, makes it kind of hard to truly understand where we ought to be. Well, I'll tell you where we ought to be. It kind of ought to be right here. Amen? What does God say about moms and dads? What, was, what does God say about families? What does God say? I shared with you earlier as we began the service about the virtuous woman from Proverbs chapter 31. Praise God. The very last thing in Proverbs, which I think is on purpose, I think it's to say, hey guys, this is important. This, this is important. What does it boil down to at the end? It's not so much whether you're virtuous about this or you know, strengthened about that or whatever. The main thing is that you love the Lord. Amen? The main thing is that you fear God. And don't think that fear is a bad thing. The Bible calls for fearing the Lord. Amen? And it's not just a trembling, you know, a, you know, with no relationship with God. It is the relationship with God. Fearing the Lord is knowing the Lord and giving your heart and life over to Him and, and going all the way that He calls you to go. Praise God. This is really the fear of the Lord. There's kind of been a breakout in our society over last several years anyway that, uh, well, more than that, it's been on a downhill ever since the Garden of Eden. But um, I'm sure there's been, uh, in most recent years, more of an outbreak of what I might call the crazies. You know, there's just, you know, you, you people are nuts. You know, what, what's, what is this? You're, you're going to let the kid try to tell you when he wants his diapers changed? I mean, and you don't want to embarrass him because you're taking his diaper off? I mean, you know, parents have a responsibility to take care of the kid. What kind of diaper rash is that kid going to have? If you wait for him to... It's okay, Mom, you can do it. I trust you. You know, I mean, come on. 
I think it's crazy. I'm sure people through the years have thought the church to be crazy as well. Taking the Lord seriously. Taking, taking God in His Word, at His Word. Amen. A lot of people have called that crazy. Believing in Jesus and believing in the signs that follow the believers. Amen. We talked about that. Well, if you're still there, I hope you are. Mark 16, because we're going to look at this. But just before that, what was, you know, uh, signs shall follow them that believe. We went through these last week. You know, these are real. These are real things. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And just to be a reminder here, a voice of reason here, this is not talking about, you know, going down south and coming into some, you know, holiness church or something and, and uh, you know, getting snakes out of cages and handling them and showing how saved you are because you didn't get bit. I went over that at length last week. And we're not going to do it again. But, you know, that's not what it's talking about. I think it's talking about the missionaries like Paul that were out in the jungle. And he was under arrest and he was gathering firewood for the fire. And when he plopped the firewood into the fire that was already existing, the snake, the poisonous snake, leaps out of the firewood and grabs the back of his hand. Grabs probably about here. And Paul sees the snake, he knows it's poisonous, he shakes it off into the fire, and of course the, the snake is destroyed. And everybody thought he was going to die within a minute. Everybody was watching, waiting him for to, to keel over. He's got to die, that was a poisonous viper. And he doesn't. He doesn't die. That's what we're talking about. Amen? And that kind of stuff probably happens a good bit. You get out in the jungles with the missionary teams and so forth. You probably run into all kinds of troubles. And God says, God says, or you drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt thee. Okay? Now, but if you go ahead and grab a big cup of poison and, and go, okay, let's see if God's right about this and glug, 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 glug. I don't think you have much in the way of promises. You don't put God to the test. You don't try him with these things. People don't get it. People don't, they misunderstand. They're kind of crazy on these things, I suppose. Well, anyway, we talked about that at, at length. These signs that follow. The miracles that follow. Praise the name of Jesus. The Bible says, sometime later. Um, I'll tell you what. I think what I want to do for here first is uh, look at Mark 16 and just pick up where we left off last week and take a look at this. I'll go into some detail, but I, I want to take this as it comes. Okay, you ready? Look at verse 19 and 20. This is the end of what the chapter has for us, okay? So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them in that previous time of speaking and meeting with them, he was received up into heaven. This is the ascension. This took place ten days before uh, Pentecost. Uh, they call this Ascension Sunday uh, a lot of times, but it's only seven days before Pentecost. So the days aren't meant to be, you know, well, this is, this is exactly when this event happened, you know. It's not saying that. It's just saying, on this Sunday we'll put Pentecost, on this Sunday we'll put the Ascension, even though they were actually ten days apart. Anyway, uh, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And if you were to mix all of the Gospels together, this is where the ascension would go. It's not here in Mark. You can see that clearly. Mark has only been given some things to talk about. His was the earliest Gospel, and God perhaps didn't want to bog everybody down with a whole lot of detail at one time. So they have Mark's Gospel, 14 years after the resurrection, and it doesn't have all of the re resurrection appearances in it. And I think that's on I know that's on purpose. God doesn't do stuff that's not on purpose. Amen? But that's where it would fit. Now, I'll show you this in a minute. But then verse 20 says, And they went forth. Well, they went forth. Isn't there anything else that has to happen before they went forth? Well, there you go. That's where Pentecost would, would uh, pop in, so to speak. That's where Pentecost would fit in. 
after Pentecost, you could then say, and they went forth. So the ascension and Pentecost happened between 19 and 20. Okay? And the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following, Amen. Now there are some other things that happened after that. And that, as I go through this, I'll show you where they fit in. Uh, at the very end, I'll show you how they fit in. Alright? So, we are told um, just before, just before verse 19 that there was another resurrection appearance that involved 500 people all at one time. Uh, and I'll tell you what, I know where that is and it's all together in one place. So let's do that. There were 500 together. So turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Very brief mentioning of this. Okay. I'll start at verse 5 just to get going on it. Alright, it's only a few verses. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Right? And that he was seen of Cephas. Cephas is another name for Peter. So we saw that back in Mark as well. Uh, and how that all fits together. Well, so he was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve. And we saw that on the second Sunday after the resurrection. Um, and so we're not going back over these things. I'm just pointing them out. And after that, verse 6 says, And he was seen of above 500 brethren. Okay? Uh, Jews, in other words. And they were all seeing Jesus at the same time. Of whom the greater part remain up to this day, up to the day that 1 Corinthians was written, that they're still alive. Many are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. So some have passed away since. That's what that's... Do you see what I'm saying there? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6. That's what it says. I don't make this stuff up. That's exactly what it says. All right? Now, some people have suggested that, oh, they didn't really see Jesus. In fact, they say, well, they didn't really see Jesus in any of these things. These are all made up to try to show that Jesus is alive. And, of course, the people that continue to not believe are going to hold to that. They don't want to believe. They don't want to give up the, their control over their lives. So they toss Jesus aside. I don't want to believe that. So, none of these... Appearances can be true, including this one that he appears to 500 people at one time. Fact of the matter is, there is no such thing as mass hallucination. People can hallucinate, that's true. But you're not going to get 500 people to see the exact same thing at the exact same time. You might see, see people come up with their own versions on things and so forth and so on. But to say there were 500 together in the same place at one time seeing Jesus, they've got to say no to that because they don't want him to be alive. A lot of people today don't want Jesus to be alive because then he expects control over their lives. And if they don't want to let him have control, they've got to keep him dead. So they say this didn't happen, that it was just a mass hallucination. Well, since those don't happen, uh, then this did. 500 people at one time did see him. See, it says at once, not over time, at once. 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain. In other words, most are still alive. So actually you could go out and hunt up these people. You could go find the rest of these that are alive. You could interview them and you would find out for yourself that they saw Jesus. It's pretty easy usually to see somebody lie versus tell the truth. You can pretty much sense it. Okay? After that now, it says in verse 7, he was seen of James. Now this James is believed by many, and I suggest that many commentators have said so as well, that this is James, the brother of Jesus. Some have suggested that it's the other James. Okay? Not quite sure how that fits in, because James was the first one besides Stephen to be martyred. And so you have to look at the timeline and see what fits what. But most people say this is the brother. James the brother. A physical, biological brother. Half biological brother. Okay? Had Mary as his mother. 
and Joseph as his father, and Jesus didn't have Joseph as his father. Jesus had God as his father. Alright? Okay? After that, he was seen of James, and then of all the apostles. That's what we've all seen. And then lastly, and I'll just mention it here, and last of all, he was seen of me also. Well, who's me? Well, Paul's writing the book of 1 Corinthians. Paul has seen him too. And you remember, in the book of Acts, Jesus showed up more than a couple of times, I believe. And, I mean, there's red letter print in the book of Acts after Jesus is gone. But he's alive. Amen? And he came and he appeared to Paul and revealed his will for what Paul was going to be doing in the coming days. And look what he says. As of one born out of due time. In other words, his story doesn't fit with all the others that saw Jesus. That was all while he was on earth during those 40 days. This is later. This is years later that Paul actually sees Jesus. And one born out of due time literally means, this word born here, born out of due time, literally means to cut, to excise out, to abort, to be miscarried. It's the opposite of actual birth. It's the opposite of actual birth. He's describing himself as one aborted. One aborted. Here he was, against Jesus all the way, persecuting the church, gathering them up for execution. And then all of a sudden, he sees Jesus. Praise God. All of a sudden, he sees Jesus. He, that's the way he pictured himself. One aborted. Okay? One born out of due time. For I am least of the apostles, that I am not me to be called... The, an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace, which ha- was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. It's God's power that, uh, that allowed Him to truly live for God, as it is with us. Amen? Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach. And so ye believed. Amen? Amen. So ye believed because of what we did. We preached. We did what God said to do. All those other disciples and me, not at the same time. You know, I mean, well, they're out there. But, uh, But Paul gets on the scene several years later. And so he's making it clear. But by the grace of God, which was with me. Okay? So therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach. And so ye, the people, believed. Came out of unbelief and came into true belief. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Now these first two that I mentioned, the seeing of by five, 500 at once, <laughs> I almost upped it to 5,000, 500 at once, and James, uh, both are very, very important. There's no doubt about that. I think I've been showing all along through the weeks here the church's distractors, detractors rather, the ones that come against God. Paul, in his earlier days, the one that comes against God. The ones that refuse to believe in the resurrection. The ones that, you know, I want to believe my own way. I want to have my own interpretation. And so I'm not going to listen to all that stuff. They, my friends, are the crazy ones. They are the crazy ones. For the word of God has certainly been confirmed. If you're away from Mark 16, the very end, uh, come back into it. I want to show you something. It says in verse 20, now this is after Pentecost, and they went forth, now this is, this is him, uh, this is the disciples rather, taking off for parts unknown. They went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. In other words, they weren't doing it in their own strength. And confirming the word with signs following. Amen. 
Now, Stephen sees Jesus soon after all of that, right? Sees him up in heaven. And within minutes, he's dead and up in heaven with the Lord. Amen? Jesus had stood for Stephen because Stephen had stood for Jesus. Glory to God. And then there's all these, these appearances I just mentioned to you about, uh, you know, with Paul seeing him, which of course is much later, even years later, and that happens after verse 20. See how it all fits? All of these things fit here. But Paul, or, uh, Mark was just told, don't tell it all. Don't give everything. I don't know why. I think it might be, you know, to not... Maybe it's to not confuse people 14 years after the resurrection. Short period of time, actually. And so he's just to give a brief and succinct gospel. Um, other than that, I don't know. I don't know. That's the way God wanted it. Because Mark wouldn't have done it if God didn't want it. The Bible says that the people that wrote these books, these gospels, they wrote them inspired by God. God gave the words, they put the pen to the paper. So forget this nonsense you'll hear people talk about. Well, the Bible was just written by people, so it doesn't mean anything. It's not God's word. We don't have to listen to it. That's just to get God out of their lives. That's a lie and it's an excuse. The fact is, these people are, it says right in the Bible, that they were inspired by God to write down what they wrote. They were inspired and they took the pen in, on paper and wrote this stuff out. Amen? People twist, people turn, people just want to get out of obeying God. Just want to be having their own life and doing their own thing. And, and they're willing to, to even lie about it to... Uh, to get away from him. Well, it isn't going to do any good, I'm telling you. By the time things come down to the end, God knows it all. Amen? Amen? It's not going to do any good. All right, Mark 16. I want to take a look at something of that that I, that I plugged in. Like right after 19, I plugged in the ascension. I want you to turn to that for just a minute. Now, we're not going to take a long time with these. These are... These are pretty much just going to be um, mentioned. I'd like you to turn to Acts chapter 1, please. It's right after the Gospels. Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1. Just trying to pull things together, and uh, we won't take long with this. Acts 1. Praise the Lord. Acts chapter 1. I want to take a look at um, verses 9 and following. And I'm going to go quickly here. 9 and following. Acts chapter 1. And when Jesus had spoken these things, this is verse 9, while they beheld, he was taken up and the cloud received him out of their sight. This is the ascension. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them. Now these are angels. Just like we're in the tomb to tell the women that Jesus is risen. Two men. Okay? But they're angels. Stood by them in white apparel. Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And of course the whole thing goes, goes on. I'm not going to take the time to uh, go through it. You can look at it for yourself. But look what it leads to. They're together and they're praying. And guess what? They're praying for the Holy Spirit to come down. And who's all there? It lists off all the disciples here. But then it says, um, then it says in verse 14, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is, which the, is with the disciples at this point, and with his brethren, referring to the biological brothers of Jesus, sons of Mary. Elsewhere in the Bible it mentions them by name. 
So they had other children. Some people try to say that Mary never had any kids after Jesus. Uh-uh. The Bible says she did. She and Joseph. They had several kids. All right. Well, and then after that, what happens? The Holy Spirit comes. Chapter 2. I'm saving that, of course, for next week. Because next week is about Pentecost. And so we'll dig into that, you know, a little bit later. Uh, but I want you to see how this was all leading to what? It was all leading to Pentecost. Praise God. And the need for the Holy Spirit. Amen? Do you, do you see what's happening here? Everyone is being prepared for what is really needed. And that's the coming of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we're going we're gonna to see that come to fruition next week. Praise God. I want to mention a definition to you. Look at verse 20. Now I'm still over in... Um, you can turn back to it. Mark uh, at the end. Mark 16. Keep your finger there because we're back and forth on this. Anyway, it says, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs. Now the word confirming is an interesting one from the Greek. It means to be firm. Confirming means to be firm about something. Security. Inspired. Confidence. To strengthen and make true. To fulfill. The opposite of confirming the word is to doubt or to waver. And unbelieve. There you go. There it is. That's God's purpose in this whole thing is to get rid of the unbelief and get people to believe. Amen? Confirming the word with signs. Following. Praise the Lord. Um, once again, you can keep your finger at Mark, but I want you to turn back over to 1 Corinthians um, 15. We already went over most of that. Um, but I want to see, have you see this again? Look at verse 11. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 11. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. That's God's purpose in this whole thing, is to get people out of unbelief and into true belief. Praise God. There's a couple of other things that happen. I mentioned it briefly just to put it into context. But there's Stephen. Stephen, you'll know, gave him the whole story. Uh, they didn't want to hear it. Gave him the whole story. Told these unbelieving Jews all about Jesus and who he was and all of that. And then Stephen looks up into heaven and he sees Jesus. Up at the right hand of the Father. He sees Jesus. But the Bible says he sees Jesus standing. Generally, probably always, every time it's mentioned that Jesus is up into heaven, he is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Okay? But for now, in this moment, he is standing. And why that? He'll sit down later, of course, but why standing? Because Stephen had stood for Jesus, just in what he was preaching even. Not to mention Everett, the whole life. Jesus had, or, um, Stephen had stood up for Jesus, and now Jesus is standing up for Stephen, and welcoming, welcoming him into heaven. Praise God. Amen? And he ends up giving his life. As you know, they stone him to death, and he's then going to be up in heaven with Jesus. Praise God. And last but not least, though, there's even, there's even more about appearances as you go through the book of Acts. And I've mentioned this just to, just to bring the context into it. And that's Paul seeing Jesus at different times. And they were times, primarily, when Paul was getting a little scared. Getting a little... I don't know that I can actually say unbelieving. But getting to the point where he doesn't know really what to do. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. And Jesus appears to him and tells him that Jesus will be his strength. 
He appears more than once, so he's got more than one thing to say to him. But he needs Jesus to make it through these things. And Jesus appears to him and tells him, you got it. You got it. I will be with you. We will go all the way together, even to a martyr's death. It was to help Paul be led by the Holy Spirit in the right direction to go God's way. Amen? And know that it was from Jesus. So it's not just some voice he heard. You know, people say, well, I heard a voice. Well, yeah, you might have heard a voice. You know, there's bumper stickers that say, I, I listen to the voices I hear. <laughs> Turn around and hit the guy behind you. I mean, you know, what are the voices going to be? It matters if it's Jesus or it's not. <laughs> Amen? Praise God. Well, guess what? Guess what? Hallelujah. A.W. <clears throat> Tozer, he put it this way. He said, Paul was a seeker and a finder and a seeker still. It wasn't good enough for Paul that he found the Lord. Wasn't, he didn't just sit back and go, yeah, well now I know Jesus and now I got all I need and I can go ahead and run around and have my own life and do my own thing and so forth. No, Paul was a seeker and a finder and a seeker still. A.W. Tozer said this, Many who claim to be all about him seek and find but seek no more. Now what he's referring to, and by the way, this is a very important topic to Tozer. He wrote a whole book on it, actually. What he's doing is warning people about this hyper-dispensationalism where they, um, they, they figure that somehow Paul knows more about everything concerning the gospel than Jesus does. I told you, my own brother-in-law has told me, I don't know if he still believes it, I hope he doesn't, but he told me one time, he says, Jesus doesn't even know what grace is. Jesus doesn't even know what grace is because it's all about Paul now. For us in the church, it's all about Paul. We don't have to really pay much attention to Jesus. Paul will fill us in. Paul is the evangelist now, you know, and he's the one we need to listen to. And Jesus doesn't know anything about grace and Paul knows everything. That's blasphemy, people. That is blasphemy. But that's what some people believe. And, uh, oh, there's another guy. He's on TV. What's the... Fel, Fels Dick or something like that? He believes that stuff too. I heard him once. And uh, it's not right. It's not true. They've got Paul set up as some kind of God and Jesus becomes next to nothing. He's for the Jews and Paul's for the Gentiles. So we only listen to Paul. We don't have to listen to what Jesus says. That's wrong. That's wrong. Paul would never say that. Paul would never do that. No way. Paul's spirit was that of the loving explorer. He was the prospector, A.W. Tozer says, among the hills of God searching for the, for the gold of personal spiritual acquaintance. Many stand today by Paul's doctrine who will not follow him in his passionate yearning for a divine reality. Tozer once said, those that, are, that claim to be more about Paul than anything else are the least Pauline of all. Referring to being about Paul and what, he, what they say he says. They, they're not characterizing Paul accurately at all. Because they've made Jesus take a back seat or a back burner or however you want to look at it. Praise God that seeking and that finding didn't stop with Paul's generation. It didn't quit with just Paul and then everybody after him is running around, you know, not knowing what to do, unbelieving and all of that kind of stuff. Huh? No, there was one of his followers, one of Paul's followers. His name was Titus. And he would exemplify all of that as well. Listen to this. It says in Titus, Chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled lives in this present age. And here's the devotional based on that. Titus was Paul's troubleshooter. Every time we see him 
in the New Testament, he's tackling a, a difficult problem for the Apostle Paul. Think about it. In the letter bearing his own name, Titus, Titus was on the island of Crete, which was known for its laziness, its lying, and its gluttony. You see that in Titus chapter 1 verse 12. Paul had sent him to straighten out things in the church. One of the hallmarks of the letter is the emphasis on self-control and self-discipline. For an interesting Bible study, read through these three short chapters looking for every reference to personal discipline and self-control. In Titus chapter 2 verses 11 and 12, uh, Paul says that the same grace of God that has appeared to all people with salvation also has the power to enable us to say no to temptation and to live with self-control. What kind of self-control do we need? You know, we need to come to the Holy Spirit and ask that. You know, what is it I really need in order to let you be in control of my life, Lord? I mean, is it laxness about credit cards? Is it uh, anger or anxiety? Some people have like tobacco and alcohol, gambling temptations and so forth. With, with, your, with your thought life, maybe, perhaps. I mean, it's different for a lot of different people. With your diet or eating habits, with exercise, profanity, pornography, sexual immorality, in all its various forms, laziness, entertainment, diversions. I mean, there's a lot of different things. Louisa May Alcott once wrote this. She said, a little kingdom I possess where thoughts and feelings dwell. And very hard the task I find of governing it well. We cannot actually govern our own hearts. We can surrender to the Lord and let Him lead it and let Him govern it. But the grace of God can govern it. Praise God. The fruit of the Spirit. It says in Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 is self-control. Now that doesn't mean that you decide what you're going to do and who, how you're going to be and all that. No. You leave it up to God. You, you let go of your own control and leave it over to the Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. Confirming the word. Some people think the whole thing is crazy. Too bad. I mean really. Too bad. Let's get serious about the Lord. See what he says about these things. And let's listen. Amen? And obey. The fact of the matter is, you know, you can go ahead and think all this stuff is crazy and it's not for you and all this kind of stuff. Um, lunch meat, people. Lunch meat. Baloney. The fact of the matter is, your God loves you. Jesus suffered and died to take away your sin. Why would you insist on holding on to it. It's really the other way around, you see. There's a lesson for all of us in, in this thing. And especially for parents. And today, especially for mothers. And thank God for the mother. Amen? And, you know, thank God every day for those that have gone before us. Praise God. I, many of us, you know, our mothers are not here on this earth. But, oh, what they did for you. And you, probably, you may not have seen it all. You may not have seen it all at all. Amen? And maybe you think, oh, my mother wasn't so hot. My mother wasn't so good. Well, so doesn't that drive you to the Lord even more? And say, Lord... Make me one who will truly take care of these children, of this family, of this home. Amen. Praise God. So especially for mothers. I mean, it is Mother's Day. It's not Father's Day. Amen. We'll get into that another time. Praise God. Mothers, confirm the word. Amen? Do you hear me? Confirm the word. Show it is true in your life because you are being obedient to it. And not your version of it. 
Not your reinterpretation of it, but what the Bible says. Amen? There's where the truth comes out. Praise the Lord. Last week we talked about the two wings of truth, right? Two wings of truth. Powerful truth set before us. Praise God. Same thing here. In fact, that would be a good thing for right here. You know? To recognize the two wings of truth. Every mother needs to know what the two wings of truth are. Praise the Lord. Amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. Confirm the word. Amen? Now some think it crazy. I know that. Some think it's crazy. But that's really only because they don't want to deal with it. And uh, don't want to surrender to it. Don't want to give their hearts and souls and lives over to it. But it's the most blessed thing there is to do so. We're talking about a God who loves us and knows the best for each and every one of us. It's not like he's guessing. Amen? It's not like he's guessing. He's not just going through life going, I wonder what I ought to do about that. You know, should I tell him this? Should I tell him? Oh, here it is, right here. Amen? But we've got to be careful we don't twist it. A lot of times people want to turn it around and make it into something that goes along with their ideas more so. It's not going to work. It doesn't really work now, even though you think it does, but it's not going to be good in the end. Amen? God knows what He's doing. And he loves you. And he wants you. Amen? And he wants families. He wants families. Why do you think when the disciples were told to go get the donkey, they brought a mommy donkey and a baby donkey? And Jesus didn't tell them, you know, get rid of the little one. That's not going to do me any good. No. I think he was showing that Jesus wants to be carried by the whole family. Amen? Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Lots of things in the Bible like that. Amen? Ways that God has of speaking things so that it's known to be true. Amen? So, some might think it's crazy, but, you know, shouldn't, because it's true. Praise God. Glory to God. Father, I just got to thank you, Lord, in this moment for everything that we have here. Everything, dear God, that has been seen here. That we know it's your truth and we know it's your way. And we know, dear God, that uh, we can let you be in control. Hallelujah. To take over, dear God, in our hearts and lives and just take us the whole way. Hallelujah. Help us to see that as a glorious thing, dear God not a hardship. I think some people look at it as some kind of bad thing or hardship, but that's because they're trying to hold on to their own understanding. If we're willing to give that up, praise God, you'll have your way. And it will go all the way for the sake of Jesus. We thank you. We praise you, Lord. We know, dear God, that this is all true. I do pray, Lord, we'd live it as though we truly do know it's true. And uh, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. We give you the glory. Hallelujah. In Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.